Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Welcome into the Friday, September 9, 2022 Market Plus. Elaine Cub is with us as we had a show. Um, okay, Elaine, I, I had to admit something before we started taping about travel. The last time you came down, and I asked a lot of people this summer about what did they see when they were making the trip? How did things look? It's easy to make a dashboard tour, mm -hmm. and then you have these tours that actually dive into the fields mm -hmm. and look. Nobody's happy because no. that's, not what, not, that's not what's happening outside their backyard. Right. Why is backyarditis a problem? Particularly in a year like this, I mean, you started off the show, the, 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 the main show, with haves and haves nots, right? Like there, there was such very different prospects and results being seen by people this year. Yes. They're not having a shared experience right. during this particular growing season. If out, you're out in western Nebraska versus, you know, someplace, I've had lots of rain this summer. It's been a lovely summer. So, but it really affects the way people um, experience market results or USDA numbers, right? On Monday, you know, the USDA is probably going to cut corn yields and soybean yields, but it's not going to be enough for the people who are going to look out their own backyard and see, you know, it's drought, it's drying up, the corn is firing, and they expect to see a bigger cut. And I think almost certainly a bigger cut is going to be justified farther down the road than whatever conservative step that they take during this September report. But nevertheless, I feel there's a reason why we have one big national aggregator doing a shared public number for everybody to use. And it is so that we're not, we're not bound by this phenomenon of backyarditis. It's so that we can get one big official number that is aggregating all of the data together. And to some extent, we do just kind of have to trust that process, that they are the only ones who have all of the, the observers that go out week by week to get those condition ratings and do more than just a backyard tour, that they do have a, a sense of what the local conditions really are. And once you put those all together and average them all together, there's immense power in averaging. There's immense mathematical power in averaging and getting a real result. And the number of people that are surveyed. Yeah. And on a consistent basis. Yeah. I, I'm not here to defend and asking you to be the, the well, I'm happy to be the defender. But yeah, they're doing more than just calling five guys and asking what you see out your back window. You know, yeah. that, that it is, there is immense power in that averaging averaging and it's more than just what's out your own backyard. Okay. And it's not the orange juice futures of trading places where it can be easily <laughs> influenced? Okay. Well, yeah, who knows? We're not going to get into that right. conspiracy theory now. We're going to start with questions that came from you. Thank you very much, uh, everybody on Facebook and Twitter. Let's start with Gary in Franksville, Wisconsin, who's got a nice little streak going here of getting his question asked. Gary wants to know, with no weekly export results, can the USDA get by with very minor changes on this report? Does this buy them time to kick the can to get a better feel once harvest starts? Yeah, I don't know that we should be looking for a big change to the export number. I mean, as we get to the end of the marketing year, they're probably not going to totally meet those 2022 expectations. But I wouldn't worry necessarily about the USDA economists' ability to continue using their same models to come up with whatever numbers they want to come up with. My understanding is they probably have whatever export data they need to have that they would use anyway. They're just not releasing it out officially this last couple of weeks because it's not in a statistically, you know, kosher form that can be put in the same data stream. They want to make, I don't, I don't I, know what's don't going either. on, but I would imagine the folks who are coming up with that WASD report have all the data they need. Okay. You get asked a lot of strange questions uh, when you come here by me. This one is Right in there. Okay. Okay. Tractor Ninja in Colorado. Yeah. And let's give us a wider perspective on this one. Does the world care if there's no millet crop? A, tell me what a millet crop is and why do we care? Does the world care? Mm, I don't know. Well, millet farmers care, Tractor Ninja, for instance, and the millet market cares. And I do like this question um, from a broader perspective. Like, I honestly don't know what the price of millet is, but these specialty crops are going to be an important piece, and they're going to be an important piece even on Monday if the USDA does start changing acreage data based on, you know, FSA numbers of what they see, not just millet, but we're talking your milo, your sunflowers, um, all of that 
was hot in the spring during spring planting season. So this is a bigger player than usual. However, you look at prices now for some of these specialty crops, sunflowers in particular, anything that's sort of oil seed related has definitely come down. Um, Malaysian palm oil is 50% off its highs. Soybean oil is only 25% off its highs. Sunflowers are like $26 a hundred weight now, which is again, you know, a sinking down from the from the spring highs, and I think that will be true of all of the uh, specialty crops. I would imagine that's the case for millet, but to be honest, Paul, I do not know the price of millet right now. But I appreciate you diving into it and giving some love, insight on that. Someday, Paul, I would love if we did a whole program on specialty crops. We do okay. your lamb market, you know. Um, we have a couple of stories uh, about that yeah. in the works, and we do get to some of those in the MTM podcast. So. Maybe we bring it into this discussion, too. I think that'd be great. Okay. Uh, Mitch in Wisconsin. Soybean meal basis for new crop October 22 and September 2, September 23 is very strong currently. Do you see it remaining high or eventually softening with new crop? I do see it softening. So you think of basis for anything right now is very, very hot for your old crop corn. Old crop soybeans are overs right now. Soybean meal Anything that you need, everything is, is kind of short. Like we are not overwhelmed with supply of any sort of feed grains or feed market whatsoever. So things are hot. And, and yes, typically once you get through a gut slot of harvest, particularly if there's any sort of trouble with, um, well, if you had a nice harvest, things would immediately come down basis wise. I was going to say as long as there's no trouble with railroad shipments. Because oh, you, are you looking ahead of one of the questions oh, no, I have here? Oh, sorry, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I would say I would expect to see basis weaken as harvest as it usually does unless something strange happens with shipping. We'll get to the rail in a minute. Uh, I want to go back to basis because I know you like to talk about basis. You've charted on basis before. Does basis, let's go back to the very first thing we discussed mm. in PLUS. How does basis relate to backyard-itis? Because does it, oh, yeah. does it support some people who think I don't have a crop and that's why the basis is off? Or how well, does no, that tie I, together? Yeah, absolutely. I think that the patterns where the, the patterns we're seeing in basis right now are absolutely related to local supply and demand characteristics. So basis is very hot in the Texas panhandle, which is as it should be, but it's, so let's say 70 over in Amarillo. It's also 70 over in Sioux City or a dollar over or a dollar 10 over, you know, Sioux County, Lyon County, Northwestern Iowa, um, anywhere there's livestock, right? Those critters got to eat. So old crop basis right now is incredibly hot, and it's hot in sort of unusual places. Places that would typically have unders are, are way over because you got to feed that livestock. So it's really interesting to see, and it is very much related to local local supply and demand. So in an, in an end, well, because all basis is local. All basis it, is local. That's the old politics yeah. uh, line there. Okay, let's go back to the rail question. This one's Phil in Dresden. You knew he was going to ask you a question. He wants to know, cash markets are efficient and usually result in corn, beans, and wheat getting to where they are needed. However, how would a potential rail strike upset that apple cart? It would really upset the apple cart. And whose rail strike are we talking about here? Anything specific right now? You know, I, yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically who's going to do it. And I think that it hasn't the federal government been trying to work this out and get some commitments from people. But we've seen this, any sort of rail trouble, we've seen what happens. And what happens is that basis gets higher or stronger for the people where it's already strong and really bad for the end users and it gets weaker and even worse for the people who are at the other end of the rail line that are trying to ship it out. So North Dakota, for instance, is particularly dependent on getting on rail to get all of their crops out towards a, a, a population center. And, it, you know, where basis is typically weak, it will get much weaker. And where be basis is typically strong, it will get way, way fierier than it is even now because you have shortages and overwhelming um, supply in mismatched places. It would be bad. Okay. Let's put it that way. Let's go, uh, let's do, uh, go to Tim in Crookston, Minnesota, near the North Dakota area. He lives with what you're just talking about with a projected smaller corn crop this year. His question is, has the battle for 23 acres started already? Yes, and if I will, I will kind of shoehorn in that fertilizer topic on this too. Because it's on my list. We'll go it and we'll do it now. Yeah, because absolutely, folks got to be thinking ahead for 2023. You got to be thinking ahead for price-wise and inputs. Um, yeah, so I did, I, I did a study recently. I Hat tip to my local fertilizer retailer, 
you know, sort of nudged me and suggested to start buying fertilizer for 2023. And I, you know, this is earlier than I would typically do it. So I did a study about uh, the seasonality in the fertilizer markets. Like, should we have an expectation of when when's the best time of year to buy fertilizer? And it turns out that there is seasonality that, you know, it's typically high in the spring and during planting season. Okay, pretty obvious. But the lowest average price is usually late October or late August and early into early September. So, you know, right now is a, would be a good time. You know, in 2012, however, if we were looking at a pattern for a previous time when fertilizer prices were really high, it did just kind of dwindle lower and lower and lower into 2013. I am not expecting to see that into 2023. And here's, you know, think of all of the reasons why fertilizer got so hot last fall and, and last spring. All of those reasons are still in place. The problems with Ukraine and Russia, right. the very high natural gas prices that have shut down some production in Europe, all of that is still in place. So I would expect to see one of these patterns where we do not see it fall back down. You know, you've got urea prices at 800 and hydrous at 1300. Maybe these are pretty good prices. And I know, I know it's mm. tricky to lock this in months in advance. And if you don't have storage for it, for instance, I know it's not always possible or easy to do, but... From a pure mathematics or chart base or, you know, seasonality base, this this would be a good time to think about it. Heard that was a popular article you may have written. Yes, it was. Yeah, it was oh. very okay. highly read. Search uh, DTN for that one. Uh, lastly, let's go uh, Craig in Adams, Minnesota. What's your outlook on the crude oil market? Well, I mean, what's the Federal Reserve going to do? You, know, you think it's tied directly not directly, Majority? not directly, but I do think it is, you know, certainly related to how the economy goes in general. If people, if we're able to avoid any major recession where people are going to stop using so much energy, which we haven't really seen yet. So, um, so far, so steady, I guess, for crude oil, but. Crude down this week, 42 cents to 86.57. We haven't been over 100 in a while. Right. A few weeks. Do we think we've passed 100 for a while? That seems to be the general story for all of the commodities, that we've seen the high and we're still in elevated levels, um, but there's no reason right now to expect a new explosion to a new high. Now, I don't know what you saw on the road, uh, but in central Iowa this week, unleaded with ethanol mixed down to two ninety nine a gallon. Really? Yeah. That's not what I paid at the gas no, station. No, and that's what I'm saying. But, I mean, it again, it just kind of depends on places. There's still yeah. $5 here, national average Well, and high. for the record, you didn't ask about gasoline or ethanol. You Correct. asked about crude oil, and Correct. those are very different. You know, just pumping more crude oil is not going to solve prices at the gas pump. There's you know, a bottleneck of refinery capacity in this country, and we, when we're not importing refined products from Russia, that has really been um, what's driving the consumer-level gas, price, gas prices at the station Sort of unrelated to yes. how much crude we're pumping. I understand, and, and was just maybe going to the next thing, but uh, yeah. we're out of Thanks time. Thanks for letting me. Yeah, nice. thank you for uh, saving my bacon again. Thanks, Elaine. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. It's Elaine Cub, and next week we're going to look at the uncovering of clues that might lead to a COVID-19 treatment derived from pig cells. And Don Rose will analyze the markets. I am Paul Yeager. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week.